Greetings, saints of God, and welcome to New Life Baptist Church's online preaching and teaching ministry. My name is Larry Allen. I'm a senior pastor at New Life Baptist Church. I want to thank you for being with me, and I'm excited about our topic, our topic for today. Our topic for today is going to be heaven, but before we're able to do that, once again, and I'm going to say it now, once again we have to do some summary teaching. And the reason why I keep doing that is that we have talked about so many different topics I don't want us to get lost, and then when I start to kind of like knit them together or stack them to where they're supposed to be, uh, you'll have God's chronology and not my own. And now when I say God's chronology, it's what we pick up uh, out of the Word of God. Uh, while I was getting ready for uh, today's uh, video, I was thinking about some of the topics that we covered, so I just wanted to go over them. So one, uh, we started, if you remember, for both Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday. We're doing Ministering in the Last Days. Uh, which meant now we would also be looking at us living in the last of the last days and then 2 Timothy reminding us, and there's more, but 2 Timothy 3 uh, reminding us that uh, uh, this is just the beginning, uh, that we're, gonna, we're living in perilous times and it's not going to get any better, it's going to get worse, but we would be encouraged by that because we know who the uh, choreographer is. Uh, well, every time I say that term, a lot of people forget uh, the devil, he has power, uh, but he had, doesn't have more power than us, because we know this, uh, 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And so uh, God is using the devil to get his plan uh, completed. And I'm going to say this a couple of times. Uh, God does have a wonderful, magnificent plan for us and for this world. Um, I mentioned when I said in the last of the last days, we're living in those now. But in that, we're supposed to be people of hope. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned... And whenever I look away, I have to think that gets the Rolodex going. One of the things I mentioned now, the things that we're seeing, I bet you I've said this every broadcast, yeah. Uh, the things that we're seeing in Matthew 24, 2 Timothy 3 for us is a foreshadow. Uh, because in God's time clock, the thing that will end the age that we're in will be the rapture. And I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Uh, I mentioned it, so we've also looked at, looked at the title a different way. Uh, God's time clock or end times chronology, chronology. A reminder, going fast, so let me slow down. I get all excited, and I know I have so much information, a little time to get it out. So now we're in the church age. Uh, the, the person that ends the church age would be Christ Jesus. When he comes, we call it the rapture, the catching away of the church. We go away, we're going to get to heaven. That's why we've been looking at uh, heaven and what happens to us when we get raptured to be the seat of Christ. Uh, God ushering us into uh, heaven and presenting us, the bride, the church, we are his bride. Uh, to God the Father, we'll be in heaven for the next seven years. While the tribulation is going on down here, and they're waiting now for uh, Jesus to come and to set up his 1,000-year millennial reign. A millennial means 1,000, but theologues, we like to say, and I'm not a theologue, I'm a preacher, theologue, theologian. I'm a preacher, we like to say that so people know what it is that we're talking about. Pause here now. Uh, one of the things I like about what's going on today, um, it surprises me, uh, I'm sorry, it, it doesn't surprise me uh, the things that people don't know. And so that's why I praise the Lord for all the good pastors out there uh, that are actually uh, teaching the Word of God. And I'm one of those pastors that make sure to teach the Word of God. I'm not necessarily concerned about my opinion, but what God's opinion is as far as the Word of God is concerned. Uh, I met a good friend, a church member. Uh, I had to sneak out to Walmart uh, to get a couple of things. Uh, pain pills. When you get older, you need pain pills. And since I said that, I don't know if you noticed it or not, <laughs> the shelves are empty. Uh, the doctor took me off of that veil because of some conditions that I'm going through, so he had me on Tylenol. And so when I went in to get my bottle of Tylenol, plenty of Advil there. All Tylenol is gone. So yesterday when I went, I ran to uh, two Walmarts, uh, two Walgreens, and I finally found a couple of bottles. Now, why did I say that? Uh, the shelves are absolutely empty because people now are kind of like in the panic and now their real nature is coming out, so we have a lot of people, as you've seen on the news, uh, they're hoarding it because they don't quite understand. So while I was in Walmart with a good congregation member and a friend, uh, we were discussing the, the times that we're in and the things that we need to know and understand. That, And I've said this a bunch of times, it is our God that's in charge. He's a sovereign uh, supreme. He is sovereign supreme, so he is the sovereign supreme. He is sovereign supreme and he's in total control and he knows what he's doing. So a couple of topics there is that uh, we would learn to 
and practice. So remember, we're always learning. So what? I've been preaching a long time. Long time. I've been here at this church for uh, over 33 years. And I was the, other, the last church that I was at, uh, seven. And then before that, I was preaching. So I've been doing this almost a little over 40 years. And so uh, I, I'm not totally grown yet, meaning this. Uh, we're all growing, as Peter would say, in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And, and God taking us through things so he can perfect us. And then uh, as we're getting perfected, we'll, when we get to heaven, that's when we'll be just like him. So you heard me say this. I am learning, continually learning to trust God. So the things that's going on today, uh, God is getting my attention. Now I'm going to pause again. God is getting our attention. God is getting the world's attention. But remember 2 Chronicles 7.14. I'm not going to have you turn there. Write it down. I'll just start it off with the first clause. If my people, which are called by my name, the idea is that we, his people, are responsible for uh, being a part of helping the world to understand uh, what's going on. And then because of our relationship with God and our example, uh, we call on him, repent of our sins, uh, make sure to be the people that we're supposed to be so that he can heal our land. So we will be crying out to God to save our nation. Ah, I have so many pauses here. And when I... When you saw me do that, I'm not bored. I just, my brain is going like 100 miles an hour in this area because uh, here's, here's what uh, I'm wanting people to understand when I say God knows what he's doing. Um, things that are happening, remember, this is no accident. So you probably figured it out when I said God is using these things to get our attention. Uh, to help us to be mindful, to be witnessing, slow down, make sure to have our priorities in order. And then once we get our priorities in order, we'll know how to evaluate ourselves. And we'll be getting that when we get back again on the next Sunday morning service. But God has a knows exactly what He's doing, so He's teaching us to trust Him. Remember where I left you? I left you at trust. So these things are coming into my life to show me where I am fully trusting Him, where I'm not fully trusting Him, of where I've taken things into my own hands, uh, to where maybe I thought I had it together. And then what God does, because He loves me, we're going to be talking about that in a minute, uh, He's allowing things to come into my life so that I can, I uh, like this, so I can see how He's working and see myself and then make sure to make whatever the changes are. Uh, that gets you to another little doctrine in that area to where we are confessing and repenting. So. In that area, falling short of the glory of God, you're going to hear that three times today for sure. Uh, all of a sudden, I begin to realize, wow, I've fallen short of His glory here. I've been doing my own thing, so then I would make the change. So back to the trust again. Third time, we're back at the trust. So then God shows me, okay, Larry, you were doing pretty good, son. See, I'm His son. You're His son. You're His daughter. You're doing pretty good, son. But here's how, here's how you should be thinking. Here it is what you're supposed to be doing. Here it is what you're supposed to know, what you're not supposed to be doing. Uh, the other topic, uh, the other topic we've been just, uh, I've mentioned a couple of times, of uh, the coronavirus or COVID-19, and I wrote some things down. And here's what I wrote for us. We are up in it. Every week it's getting worse and worse. Have you noticed, they're not sure that they be in the world of leadership and all, not criticizing them, they're doing the best job that they can, but we have a world leader. His name is God, nobody else. And so we're up in it. Um, what is God doing getting our attention? Uh, what is God doing now getting us to focus? Uh, reminding us to trust Him and then to make sure to be following biblical instruction rather than um, the news or politics. Now, I'm not going to criticize the news. You just look at what are the best channel that you know that's going to give you some good news and then make sure to do a little bit of research so that you are not just looking at the hype or the political issues between the red and blue, uh, the political issues uh, between uh, whatever the parties are, uh, the news fighting, uh, the leadership, uh, governors fighting governors, uh, basic stupidity. All those men are trying to do, all those men and women are trying to do what they think is best. But what we must remember is that we do have a leader and his name is God. So you're going to be making sure to find some time to focus and get some prayer and your devotions in. So that after you finish hearing all the news and all the conflicting reports or the good reports, whatever it is that you hear, you will stop and kind of like <sighs> settle yourself down and make sure that you understand what God is saying. Okay, so 
Did you notice that it got us there to where we can start talking about heaven, but now before we can even talk about that subject, we need to answer two basic questions. There's more than that, but I want to make sure that we answer two basic questions. And so I don't take us here too long. I wrote them down, the two questions. One, how do we get to go to heaven? Or how do we get to heaven? Two, what do I have to do to go to heaven? Now, don't think about works theology. We're talking about methodology of the instruction that God has given us. Now, here's what I wrote for us here. If you miss this or mess it up, you will miss heaven. And before you realize it, you're going to be ending up in hell. Did you hear that? And what does the devil want us to do? The devil wants us to mess up here because he wants to keep the people that are lost. See, before I came to know Jesus, I was lost. Remember I mentioned to you a good pastor explained to me that I was lost. I finally realized that I was, and then uh, he gave me the biblical remedy. So the two questions, how do we get to go to heaven? How do we get to heaven? What do I have to do to go to heaven? Understanding now the devil's trying to keep all of this confused, uh, keep us in chaos so that we don't understand it. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we have so many denominations and religious groups. So now I'm going to give us some answers. So I'm going to be a little bit methodical for a few seconds. So one of the answers, and then I'll explain it, and we'll look at the word. It is important that you know that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. <laughs> How many times have you been hearing that? i got a whole bunch of four spiritual laws, several tracts, and all of them say that. So you'll understand, people need to understand that God loves us and He has a wonderful plan for our life. Uh, I would say corporate plan for all of Christianity. I didn't say churchianity. For all of Christianity, Christianity are those who personally receive Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior, and there's nothing in between. It's Jesus Christ plus nothing. So the idea would be, is we'd say the only way to heaven, and how did Jesus say it? Yeah, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's no other way. No preacher, no pastor, no bishop, whatever you call it, no pope, no cardinal, no elder, nothing, no baptism. It's Jesus plus nothing. Now, when I said that, uh, you need to understand how the scripture explains that, and that's why I'm being methodical. So we're going to look at John. So it'll be the Gospel of John, chapter 3. And I'm not going to be able to do every verse, but I want to make sure that we uh, understand it. And I know you know these, but you need to make sure you mark them. Like at the bottom of the Bible, say, hey, this is going to be basic gospel so people understand how to get to know God and how to get to heaven. I'm going to start at John chapter 3, verse 15. In the middle of an idea again, but it'll get us to where we need to be. That whosoever, did you catch that circle? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now let me stop there for a second, and I'm going to say this probably 19 times. How long is eternal? How long is everlasting? We have these people that teach long doctrines on how you can lose your salvation. If it's given to you and it's eternal, how do you lose eternal? You don't. So just stay with me. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Here it is. Verse 16, John 3, 16. You should have this memorized. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, there it is again, believeth in him. I want you to hear this. Should not perish but have, there it is, everlasting life. It's going to come up several times. Verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, you can read the rest yourself, but now what we're looking at now is the need to come to know him so that you will have access to heaven, and this access to heaven now is through Christ Jesus. Now, the thing that comes up here now, you need to ask yourself, we need to ask ourselves, us Bible teachers, make sure to get this across, the thing between us and heaven. So I'm not talking about the saved people, I'm talking about the world, unsaved people. Uh, people could even be in church and be unsaved. Uh, what's between God and man is sin. And so what God wanted us to see here is that he 
took care of that for us. He did all the work. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that would be known as Godhead, the one God, three in one. Uh, Christ Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, who's also the Son of God, He took care of us. God so loved the world, so the conversation we have a lot of times, there was a conversation in heaven, and there was a silence in heaven, because God said, who will go? And Jesus said, I will go. And you can see everybody going, the Son of God? No, you're not going to go. The point is, because God so loved us, watch. He sent His only begotten Son, and because the only begotten Son, who is Christ Jesus, loves us, He came and died in our place. Now, I want to explain it just a little bit more as we're answering this question. So now, the Bible explains this. So you hear me say it quite often, the Romans wrote. So, Romans 3, 23. What's between us and God? Now, what's between us and God is sin. And so we had this, uh, we've had this, I think, in every broadcast, uh, but that's okay. Uh, Romans 3, uh, 23, for all, how many? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Huh. I always laugh when I was in Bible college. Uh, there was a, uh, this is back in the 70s, uh, there was a, this group that got together and they did a strong Bible study, uh, a definite in-depth word study on what all means. <laughs> now, uh, please, I'm not being mean, but I don't have to have a study. All means, as the Texans would say, all. All means all, everything. So it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6, 23. You know this, but I want you to have it. Saints in uh, New Life, I know you know this well. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. See, that's what's between us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Idea me and now, uh, if we die without Christ, we go into eternal damnation, and then we're in Hades and we're there till the judgment comes, but once you die, I need to get this straight. I'm so sorry. I know we live in New Mexico and some of the uh, teaching that you hear here, there's no purgatory. Um, you either, when you die, you either go straight to heaven or you either go straight to Hades today. Uh, Hades, uh, would be the holding tank for those who are non-Christians, uh, Luke 16, for those who are non-Christians waiting for their judgment to where they get cast into eternity. But that's another subject. Okay, so all of sin. Now, every time I do a celebration of life service, uh, a funeral, um, we know that the person that's a Christian has died. Uh, he's alive and well because he's in heaven, so... We celebrate his life and we understand that that service that we're at really isn't for the person in the casket or in the urn or there's pictures. That person's gone because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So that service is for the living. And when we're there, always ask there. I always give the gospel at a, at a celebration of life because people are hungry for the gospel because they're wondering, hey, I know this is going to happen to me. I need to hear what this preacher has to say. I don't want them to hear from me. I want them to hear from Lord, from the Lord. So what I always ask people, I look them in the eye and look all around the auditorium. I go, let me ask you a question. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm going to prove that all have sinned, so I'll ask. And I wrote them down here. Ready? Have you ever told a little white lie? And then every time I say that, I laugh. How come the little lies are white and the bad lies are black? Just teasing, but that's what people say. Uh, lie is a lie. Half truth is a lie. Have you ever not told the whole truth? <laughs> I did that today. <laughs> Have you ever had a bad thought? Yeah. Have you ever done anything bad? Well, when I'm doing that, I have people raise their hands. And, you know, have you ever stolen a candy bar? Have you ever had a lustful thought? You know all the stuff that goes on. And so the idea would be, would be now I'm proving we all sin. Uh, we could be like in a, the greatest environment, and before we realize it, our brain is just, it's fantastic brain, but it can take us anywhere. Now, let me tell you what happens now. God says, you ready? My son, Jesus Christ, took care of that for us. He died on the cross of Calvary for us. And we always call that good news. So now we're in Romans, and I don't know if you're still at 3 or 6, but I want you to go to Romans 5. I like this verse, Romans 5. And I was going to read verse 8, but I'm going to start at verse 5. So what are you getting now? It's kind of like basic gospel message. So 
uh, you'll understand that. Dr. Billy Graham when he was alive, Dr. Franklin Graham, they, they explained this really well, Louis Palau. A lot of great evangelists out there, Dr. Louis Palau. A lot of great evangelists out there. That's what they're doing. They're making sure that people understand what they have to do to be saved and who took care of all that work for them. Romans chapter 5. Now, while you're there, I know you know this. I know it too, but I have to. I go over this every day. That way when I I'm out here and I run into people that are concerned about the COVID-19, the coronavirus. Like, let me tell you, your primary concern is, so if you catch it and you die, I'm not being insensitive, I'm being factual, somehow you contact uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus, both the same, and you die, where are you going? And one person even said to me, I had never given that any thought. Another person would say, I hadn't thought about death until I got older. And so now what I'm doing is making us uh, understand what it is that we have to tell people so that we can show them that they're lost and then show them how to be found. <laughs> Once I was lost, now I was found. Christ wasn't lost, we were. So Romans 5, 5. And hope make it not ashamed. Thank you, Paul. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. So God even gives us the ability to love. Verse 6, watch this. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. He didn't say, I waited till you got it all together, you're carrying the right Bible, you're wearing a three-piece suit, have a Jerry Falwell haircut, looking like a gospel preacher, whatever the case may be. He didn't wait till we got everything right. Christ Jesus died on the cross of Calvary when we were at our worst. He didn't say, Larry, put your name here. When you get good, I'm going to die for you. He did it when we were at work. When we were railing against him, cared nothing about him, using his name in vain, every, everything that you could do to glorify Satan, what was Christ Jesus? What did Christ Jesus do? He had already died for you. Verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. Watch this now, verse 8. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 6 again. For when we were yet without strength, right? While we were yet, verse 8, last clause. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And why did he do it? He did it because he loves us. That's why he did it. He so loved the world that he died for us. God the Father so loved us that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 15, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, I get all excited about that. It kind of like, it takes my breath away, what's wrong with 1 Corinthians 15? I already know you about it. Get to know you about it. What's the matter with you, boy? Get us here. 1 Corinthians 15, when did you hear this? going to overdose us in the word again. Uh, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Talking about what God did for us as far as death is concerned in the rapture. Ready? Verse 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the same. That is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what I want you to see. Uh, just that one part. I'm not going to talk about the rapture again now. We have victory over death. Remember 2 Corinthians 5, 8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now the same book, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse uh, 3 and 4. Gospel. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which it also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. This doctrine that you're getting is according to the Scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain until this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also as one born out of due season. Now here's the idea. Uh, God wanted us to understand this here, verse 3 and 4. Uh, 
uh, his son not only died for us and was buried, but he rose again. Uh, when we talk about the resurrection, I can't spend a lot of time here because I'm getting a lot of information out. When we talk about the resurrection, we're talking about the resurrection of Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, that is our guarantee, summary teaching, that is our guarantee, we would say warranty, that since he died and he was buried and he rose again, uh, that was his guarantee for us. Now you know this part. So the Bible says, uh, uh, John 1, 14, but as many as believed and received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God. And then Ephesians 2, 8, 9, then I want you to read 10 on your own. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, uh, lest any man should boast. So by faith we believe that Christ Jesus died on the cross of Calvary for us, was buried, and he rose again, and he did it on our behalf, that all of our sins might be forgiven. Now here's what I want to do for the last part. So then when you get them there, remember we're going to get ready to get to heaven. Because so when we come back the next time, we're going to find out that heaven is a real place and what it looks like. And then pull all this together on uh, how you got there. So what we have them do is the sinners, we have them do the sinner's prayer. And I wrote it here. Uh, dear God, there's no doubt in my mind that I am a sinner. I regularly and constantly fall short of your glory. Right now, Lord, I ask that you forgive me of my sin. I'm asking that you come into my heart and that you make me the type of person that you want me to be. How uh, you make me a Christian. Okay, in closing for this segment, and I didn't get all the way, I've always got notes left over. In closing for this segment, the big deal that everybody talks about and theologues, theologians are having a difficult time with this. So let me make it categorically clear. The sinner's prayer doesn't save us. The sinner's prayer isn't unbiblical. Uh, what we're doing when, when we're talking about the sinner's prayer is we're getting them to follow Romans 10, 9, and 10. And then I'll, I'll, I'll explain that real quick. And then we'll be done. Romans 10, 9, and 10. That thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So why do I? So I'm going to categorically own what I just read. Ready? The sinner's prayer doesn't save you. The sinner's prayer doesn't save anybody. When we meet with the person, we're doing our very best so that after we share the gospel, when he prays the sinner's prayer, that he understands what he or she is doing, and then we have an idea that they possibly truly reserved, uh, received Jesus. Now, here's what I see. I've been in ministry for years. I see a lot of people come forward, walk the aisle. It doesn't matter where the crusades are, even in my own church. So I talk about the church that I pastor. They come on Sunday, they get saved, and by next Sunday, they're lost. And what does that mean? They never got saved. They even said the sinner's prayer. I remember one guy finally set him down and go, hey, this is like the sixth week in a row. <laughs> so do me a favor. The next time we do it, let's make sure that it's real. And I have to explain uh, the evidence is that you can see in the person when they have really been saved. So what I want people to understand uh, categorically, beyond a reasonable doubt, Larry Allen and the other pastors here, and those three other pastors here, uh, three church officers or two church officers, and all of us that are what we call altar workers, we do use a sinner's prayer. That doesn't mean we're apostate. doesn't mean that we're liberal. We use a sinner's prayer so that people will understand. You heard me even when I read it. So what are we doing? We're believing in our heart and we're confessing with our mouth, watch, that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he was, he died, he was buried, and he rose again. Uh, when we talk about the Lordship of Jesus Christ, uh, excellent doctrine, but I know when people receive Jesus, they don't understand the Lordship. So our responsibility, saints, is to make sure to teach them how to, 2 Peter 3.18, how to grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. My closing. Here we are. I'm going to say it again. I think I've said it for every broadcast. People are hungry. They're needing answers. And the answer is not CNN. The answer is not Fox. The answer is none of the NNs, none of the news. And Fox is a good news. That's what I watch all the time. Uh, the answer is Christ Jesus, the Word of God, and what God has said to us. The other part of the answer is supposed to be the church. I'm not talking about the buildings that we're in. I'm talking about those who died for Christ, those who believed that Jesus died for them on the cross of Calvary, person received them as Lord and Savior, and 
we are the church, we are the bride of Christ. So people should see something different in us. So when you are out there, and sometimes you will have to go to, excuse me, one of the Wally Worlds, or one of the stores that you like to frequent to get a container of milk or whatever it is, help them to see Jesus in and through you. And then if they bring up the topic, you're standing six feet away. <laughs> I know you want, you want me to say that. You're standing six feet away, and you explain the glorious gospel. And you explain who enabled us to become children of the only living God. Well, my beloved, I love you. Time goes fast when you're having fun. I'm looking forward to the next video. Uh, don't forget now, when you're out there, may, G may people see Jesus. Uh, maybe two videos ago, emanating, emanating. I like that. Watermelon sheep herder emanating from your very soul. I love you, my beloved. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We give you praise, honor, and glory. Thank you for your word. Looking forward to when we get together where now we can begin to look at the place where we're going that we call a home, our temporary home. Now, when I say temporary, that means we're going to be there seven years. Then get to come back. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi. Uh, this is pa Pastor Larry. And many people have been asking me how that they would be able to support the ministry of New Life Baptist Church and continue to give their tithes and their offerings. So my goal today is to make sure to give you as many options as possible so that you would be able to fulfill your heartfelt responsibility. Uh, one, uh, you would mail your tithes and offerings in. I'm going to read you the address, and it'll probably be at the bottom of the screen, but I want to make sure. You're going to mail it to New Life Baptist Church, 3301-R, Coors Road, Northwest, box number 243, and that's in Albuquerque, New Mexico, 87120. And if you choose to go online, you would go to, usually you used to see in www.nlbcabq.org, or you can just do nlbcabq.org. Our website would come up, and then you would have two options there. Uh, one option would be PayPal, and, and the other option would be uh, ActPay. Uh, you would choose whichever one you feel more comfortable with. And that's how you would be able to give your tithes and offers to your local church. Uh, we will need your support during this time. And we want to thank you, not only for your faithfulness with your finances, but your faithfulness for your prayer and your continued attendance through all these years. And I want to remind us, as I have in each message, we're going to get through this through the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know I'm going to say this. I love you, my beloved. Have a fantastic day and a great week.